get you guys. 11 a.m., ready to go? <laughs> All right. Welcome to Reefstock, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Than Thane. I um, own a little coral farm in Copley, Ohio, called Tidal Gardens. There's a little YouTube channel associated with that. And over the years, I have learned a little bit about how difficult just large scale projects, whether it be like large aquariums or large systems of aquariums can be. Um, because kind of going from like a smaller tank to a bigger tank, a lot of, a lot of the simple issues don't necessarily stay simple just because of the size of the project that you're working with. I kind of wanted to gear this talk to, um, to folks that either already have something that's fairly large or that they kind of want to, they aspire to something large. Because uh, just the way that um, a, a lot of, I guess, like media, like especially like Instagram, it really celebrates large, giant, ambitious aquariums. And there are some major complications with that. So things like, did you want a massive aquarium? Uh, having visited this particular aquarium, I, you, you may or may not be familiar with it, um, I don't want something that big. And after visiting it, I no longer want the, the tanks that I have at the size that, uh, I've got like 600 gallon show tanks, and it's occurring to me that, you know what, that's probably too much for me to handle. Because there are all these little quibbles that, uh, that become massive time sinks to try to solve. And that's what we're trying to do. So uh, it applies to big, giant aquariums. It applies to like a multi-tank coral farm, like what we've got going at Tidal Gardens. Uh, so Tidal Gardens is roughly, if I had to guess, something in the neighborhood of like between 15 to 20,000 gallons. So that's just kind of like, I don't know if that's a mental scale for anybody else in, in the crowd, but that's what we're talking about here. Uh, but even when you're talking about something smaller, uh, when we first started, we were about a 3,000 gallon coral farm. And these sort of persistent issues were manifesting even at that size. And it just, it scales up from there. And it doesn't get better when you add more tanks. This also applies to folks that want just a, a lot of small interconnected systems. So even if you never get into a single tank that's over 100 gallons. Let's say that you're working with just 10 gallon tanks, but you're running 50 of them. A lot of the same sort of problems are gonna persist in these multi-segmented tanks as well. Also, uh, throughout this presentation, I'm sprinkling in some, some footage that I had taken from a few months ago from the Reef Builder Studio. I thought it was kind of appropriate for, for the occasion. So uh, I've, I've never really used a lot of that footage in any of my videos yet, but I kind of wanted to share that with you guys because a lot of folks haven't been able to see the Reef Builder Studio in person, so I kind of wanted to, to give you guys a little bit of a taste. Okay, so the main problem is that the solutions that had worked in smaller aquariums simply don't scale to the larger, more complicated systems. So what, what uh, I'm showing here, this is the Mackinac Bridge. It is in Michigan, and there's like this anecdote about this bridge, that when you, when you start to paint this bridge, by the time that you get to the other end of it, because it's like five miles long or something, they have to immediately start repainting it from the beginning again. And so sometimes like the, 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 these solutions that work so elegantly, you end up just having to do them forever. And these problems never go away. And we're trying to, to develop methodologies and tech to kind of get around some of these major obstacles. So we're not painting the bridge forever. The other thing that, uh, this is kind of an aside, but it involves comp complex systems that once you start to scale up bigger, they tend to have um, what I kind of call like a chilling effect, at least uh, with the way that we do husbandry. And that is you have a lot of different corals that have very different care requirements all in the same system. And oftentimes the, the solutions to problems, it is, it's going to affect all these different critters differently. So for example, um, 
if we have a problem with a predominantly SPS system uh, and we want to deal with that specific problem well, it also really royally messes up some of like the LPS that happen to be in there. And we don't want to mess up those things because we, we also like these Ganiapora and Micromusa and whatnot. And so that gives us this like this chilling effect of, well, I don't want to, to damage these guys, so I end up not doing anything. And th that, that type of like stifling effect tends to happen when you have so much at risk that action itself can be damaging to the whole process. Okay, so general overview of what we're gonna start to cover is the, the, the problems and methods of control that involve like nuisance, whether that be algae or pest control. Um, whole tank treatments at scale because uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more, but, but long term, I mean, sorry, long story short on that, it's uh, when you're basically dosing an entire system because you're, you're not able to, like, to, to break it all apart. Uh, chemistry management testing, it gets complicated. And then finally, are there like some, some engineering things that we can do to make some of this stuff easier or make uh, a large complicated system not so has completely ridiculously hazardous? Okay, so first off, when we're talking about the, the nuisance aspect of things, uh, why can't you just quarantine everything that you bring in and you won't have to deal with any of these issues in your systems, right? Uh, so one, one of my guys actually, because when we started our new building, we said no matter what, we're going to quarantine everything for 72 days. We're going to make it rock solid. If anything has any issue or looks suspicious, we're going to kick it out to the other building entirely. And we are going to tolerate nothing going through. And he, uh, so one of my guys is very ambitious about this. And he was thinking, you know, we can, we can eliminate algae problems entirely at the quarantine stage. And me being a little bit more skeptical of that, I'm like, I encourage the effort, okay? <laughs> I am definitely not gonna argue with you or try to prevent this in any way, shape, or form. Uh, yes, I, and, and I will always encourage anybody to try to quarantine, to eliminate as many of these things in the bud as, as early and as effectively as possible. However, uh, things happen, and um, like, just like the slide says, the pests are really, really good at what they do. And generally speaking, I think that most hobbyists or even professionals, their ability to quarantine is not exactly adequate. So in our 72-day quarantine period where we were doing multiple stages of dipping, kicking out anything that re remotely looked suspicious, we got just about every pest going through at one point or another. And, it, and, it, and there's, there, there's things that can circumvent quarantine entirely. For example, like fish can just bring stuff in. Uh, we have a fish quarantine system that has never seen live rock, never seen coral, has only seen plastic plants, uh, and are all individually isolated from each other. And they got vermitted snails and aptasia. So things happen, guys. Anticipate quarantine failure. So we have to kind of look at like kind of more holistic approaches, assuming that stuff is going to get into your systems. Because controlling these things and, man and managing and mitigating the, the damage of this stuff goes a really, really, really long way. And large-scale coral farms, there's a very good chance that they have just about everything that you really are looking at that's undesirable. But it's not necessarily a problem because it is managed. Because if they did not manage it, these things are bad enough to put them out of business in a couple months. Like widespread massive pest issues means you don't have coral to sell, period. So it is possible to control these things. It's just kind of challenging at scale. That's the talk, guys, right? So first thing, don't do a snail's job, OK? You have to leverage cleanup crews whenever possible. This is probably going to apply for just about anybody's aquarium, really. Like cleanup crews are, generally speaking, a good thing. Uh, it's really tempting to get in the weeds of where like your effort 
it, it, it feels good to like get in there and start scrubbing stuff, right? Leave that to an invertebrate, please. <laughs> Because this, th th this type of like mentality will crush you once you're starting to deal with like thousands of gallons. Because th th this amount of effort, it's, it is purely a, a you thing. It is not actually helping your system nearly as much as you might hope. Leave it to your cleanup crew. The snails we use. We use astrias, trochuses, and turbos. Um, there's like pros and cons to, to all of these guys. And I happen to like the trochuses and turbos more than the astrias. Like astrias are nice because they're readily available, they're inexpensive, but they kind of like flip over and they don't unflip over and they usually get sniped by something, right? I, and I was thinking like, how do these, these things survive in the wild? And it occurred to me they probably don't. They probably get flipped over and they probably get eaten and they're just making up with it by reproduction or something, I don't know. Trochuses are nicer because they can flip themselves over and they can breed in, in your tanks. Um, I struggle with getting trochuses in healthy from anywhere. I don't know what it is, but like almost all of our shipments of trochuses do poorly. So whenever I see healthy trochuses, it's like this is a gold mine. It's like the, the, the best thing I've ever seen. Oh, as far as like healthy, it means they're not dead. Like, <laughs> so, like straight up, they, whenever I whenever I get them in, they are dead within like eight hours. That sort of that sort of thing. So if they're like if they're actually alive in somebody else's aquarium, I will pay top dollar for such things. <laughs> Turbo snails, um, uh, really, 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 really good at algae control. They are bulldozers, so you know, use cautiously. Uh, as far as like pest control for like vermitted snails, uh, I was very skeptical of bumblebee snails. But over time, I can tell that they're doing their job. It's the weirdest thing because I almost never see them interact necessarily with vermitids. But over time, it's like I've, I've introduced like this magic acid that just dissolves vermitids. And the one way that we control vermitids is that we, we have to dial down our feeding because when we crank up our, a lot of our powdered food feedings, it just makes their population explode. So when, when we cut off the, the nutrient level of just you know, their, their ability to broadcast uh, mucus webs and filter feed, cut that down and then add this type of predator, it, over time, like we're talking like months, and you, and you do need quite a few of these bumblebees to make this work, but the, the number of vermitted snails is largely controlled. And vermitids are so annoying because it is barely a coral pest in the sense that it's not going to like necessarily kill a bunch of your corals or anything, it, but they're, they're annoying in the most awful ways because you poke yourself, you get infected. Uh, a customer sees it on a plug and all of a sudden you have a huge headache over like these dumb snails. And so I recommend bumblebee snails, they're quite good. However, they do also eat trastrias that flip over. <laughs> Slight downside. Slight downside. They eat snails, you know, that's what they do. Uh, going to herbivorous fish, we generally like to employ a lot of tangs and fox faces. Um, I struggle with this slightly though because um, they are very good to a certain degree. They have hostility issues. Fox faces are venomous. I don't know if you've ever been stung by one. I have not, knock on wood. Has never happened to me. But th there are some, some quibbles. Like this particular um, tang was brought to me because he got homicidal in somebody else's tank. And so that's why we have him. Uh, also, weirdly, when it gets to scale, and, and I'll touch back on this in a bit. But I have a tank that is 600 gallons, has multiple fox faces, probably close to like 8 to 10 different tangs. And it has a macro algae issue. Because at some point, the scale of these systems, uh, it overwhelms a herbivore's appetite for that nuisance algae. And normally, like a little bit of that algae is delicious for these guys. But when there's so much live rock and so much opportunity for that stuff to grow, it even like gets above these guys' ability to take care of it. Pest control fish, wrasses, damsels. The, the, the damsels that we like are, are the Springer eye damsels. They're like the little black and white guys, black and, black and blue guys, sorry. 
Uh, in the Rasses, we use a mix of Milanaris. We use um, six lines to some degree. We like the Possum Rasses. We have Timor Rasses and one other one, Leopards. Leopards. Uh, and a lot of just like random creepy crawlies that are on, on corals or just like uh, just flatworms that are on your glass, things like that, get largely controlled by these guys. And just in our experience, as long as you don't like double them up, they generally stay pretty cool with one another. Uh, but I would definitely not recommend trying to, like, to do pairs or anything like that, only because they just get, cr uh, they can get hyper aggressive and once a fish decides to kill another fish, it goes poorly very, very quickly. Uh, like we've had a, a one inch, uh, I think it was a Melanaris, and we accidentally put another one inch one with it in a 600 gallon tank, and uh, it killed it in about 24 hours. Like, this is pretty, it's pretty bad. Uh, la let's see, butterfly fish. These guys are worth their weight in gold. Uh, there's, I don't necessarily consider like Aptasia the worst pest in the whole wide world, but having a, uh, a copper band in one of these systems is so helpful in just making it so that I don't ever have to see them. Uh, they generally speaking are, are, are kind of reef safe, except that I'm, they, they kind of eat a lot of LPS sometimes too. Uh, and th th I know s some folks, and I'm almost getting to that stage myself where it's like, you know what, if it eats a few micromusa, that is just, that's the price of admission. They're, they're worth it. They're worth it to me. Eat, eat as much as you want, you guys. Uh, the bigger issue with them is that I, I have like a, a large difficulty of getting them in healthy and eating. Uh, it's, it's a huge struggle of mine, and I wanted to go with like um, like pre-quarantine services, but the last time I did a price check on that, it was like over five hundred dollars for a copper band or something, and so that's a that's a little bit of a non-starter for me. So we're we're trying to do better as far as bringing them in and getting them to eat, but that's like the big challenge with getting this type of fish, and you need like a hundred of them in in your tanks. Let's see, uh, shrimp, cleaners, peppermints, cleaners help the fish, peppermints sometimes eat aptasia, and sometimes in, when you have enough of them, they start to eat acro-eating flatworms. I've, I've, I've heard that uh, just as an anecdote, and I've also seen like research papers on that subject. Uh, we haven't messed a lot with peppermints for that reason, but it's something that you guys should be aware of, because if you guys are having acro-eating flatworm issues, peppermint shrimp might help with that. It, we're gonna touch on this a little bit, but some of these, uh, these solutions and remedies are, like they're anti-synergistic. And unfortunately, we're getting to a point where a lot of like our crustacean type solutions are falling to the wayside because of other things we do. Uh, emerald crabs, algae problems, they help with that. Bergias also help with the Aptasia issue. Uh, we love these things. If you, if you guys have ever uh, had, just bought a, like a, a pack of these things and put it in your tank, at first they don't seem like they're doing anything. And then one day they lay eggs, and one day you don't have any Aptasia. And then they all die because they starved. And then you get Aptasia again. <laughs> That's usually the cycle of the things. And so at Tidal Gardens, like, uh, we have Bergias and we have Aptasia. And it's, you can always tell, like, it's like this wave of, like, you, you get this, like, increase in Aptasia. And then one day they're all gone. And then we see the nudibranch, and then they're all dead. And then it's, a, it's like this constant cycle. But we're not trying to actively breed these guys. And uh, the challenge with them is you need to provide them enough Aptasia because they are voracious. It's like trying to control like a forest fire. And it, it, it's, it's tough to like manage like this, this wildfire of like just activity that they're able to, to do because they're so, they, they reproduce so quickly. And they, ex they expend like, all of your, uh, your Aptasia resources, <laughs> like so quickly. Uh, they also get picked off by, by wrasses, you know, anti-synergy, right? Uh, we have noticed though that if you just put enough of them in, eventually the wrasses get bored. So <laughs> there's that too. Okay, if all of those cleanup crew have failed and are overwhelmed by your problems, 
Now it's time for you to do a sales job. And this has to kind of be done a little bit smarter than getting out the toothbrush. The toothbrush worked great for the 30-gallon tank because basically any of the problems I just, I just discussed, in, uh, on a small scale, I can personally solve with a toothbrush, right? But now that we're getting into like these larger, more complicated systems, um, we have to like start to look at other ways. So one of the ways is when we have a multi-segmented system, this is like the, the weirdest thing that I've noticed, but it's like this, each one is its own microcosm, and you can literally just isolate that one tank and just deal with those issues. Like I was thinking that because, well, let's say we have like a 1,000 or a 2,500 gallon system made up of eight or so tanks, okay? Um, I was like, well, they share the same water. I'm flowing a lot of water through, like the, the return pump is like a, a, an abyss A400. It's moving a lot of water through all of the systems. What is a problem in one tank is likely a problem in a whole bunch of the other ones, possibly. But the amount of separation between these tanks in, in practice is way more than I ever thought. And it became like very obvious to me one time when I happened to go and look at one of our systems at night. And in one small segment, there was a spawning event. I think it was like some type of sort of anemones, maybe like uh, flower, flowers, rock flowers. And this one tank looked like milk. And it's, it's connected to everything, but solid, opaque. And every other system was crystal clear. It, it's as if it had no bearing on the water of anything else. And it stayed milky for like literally 12 hours. And, and it was, yeah, it, it didn't even really clear up. I went to sleep, and it kind of like took care of itself after that. But you can have this, uh, this situation where just isolating an individual tank and dealing with it does solve the problem. If you wanted to take that to a slightly more aggressive stance, this is what we do most at our system, I would say, or at the coral farm, is that we would fully break down and empty a tank. We would catch all the fish, drain out all the water, and we would hydrogen peroxide the entire tank inside and out, re, uh, like dip all of the, the plumbing parts that are exposed to water in acid, so like all your like all the return, lock line, all that fun stuff, S scrape all that stuff off, acid bath it, and take the opportunity to inspect and dip all the corals uh, swap out new trays for everything. We use like you know custom acrylic trays for everything. Really, really, really polish clean all of that. We don't really uh, we don't treat the fish for any kind of any prophylactic thing. The fish just go back in. It, it, this takes about I would say three hours typically for a 300 gallon tank. And we would do a rotation of these every so often to get to everything. And eventually stuff does make it back into those tanks. But it buys you an extraordinary amount of time. Like before you start to see like any kind of issues pop up again, it might be like three, four months. So I really like this method. Real quick aside about dipping. Um, when, when we're doing like these long-term dipping things, uh, we've noticed that depending on the dip, a, a lot of them are kind of oil-based, and they do have like a separation that happens. So it's really important to constantly churn that water because what we were seeing was um, certain corals that we would dip, like halfway through the colony, it would just die. And it's because like over, over like a long period of time, the, the mix separates and you have this super intense layer and then you have a, a layer of regular salt water and then that super intense layer nukes your coral. So just a, a little quick, you know, application tip there. Taking that tank breakdown thing one step further, and this is basically only for like large commercial coral farms. It is a luxury if you're able to take one of those tanks completely offline, have it dry, bone dry, and then do what I kind of like call a crop rotation, where you would take an entire other set, dip all that, put it into the empty tank, refill that, break that one down completely, bone dry, and always have an empty, dry system that you can quickly swap to because 
what I previously described that would take about three hours now can be done in about a half hour. And if you always just have that one ready to go, you can blow through a super big facility. I'm talking like 50,000 gallons, like on the regular. And if you do that level of polishing, I promise you, your pest issues will be so minimized that it's, it'll be like a huge afterthought. And spending an hour a day for this type of performance, that's a good deal. Really good deal. OK. Uh, let's say all of that didn't work out. Uh, now we're talking about a whole tank chemical treatment of some sort. Um, there's a few different ones that we've, that we've tried. And as a hobbyist, I was the most anti whole tank treatment guy ever. Like I wanted to have a, like a very ecosystem-esque approach, trying to do a lot of biological control. And essentially trying to avoid every snake oil product possible because there's always some major, major you know, downsides to all this. I hate the idea of it, OK? My coral farm has taught me differently. <laughs> and so I've had to like, try some, some, some new, uh, new methods. And they have their pros and cons. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Interceptor. It is mainly used to control red bugs on like Acropora. That's kind of like why it got popular. Long story short there, they are, it, 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 the chemical, I forget, it starts with an M, millisim something oxide. That's the active ingredient. It nukes crustaceans. And it does it really, 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 really well. It's by prescription. It's a pain to acquire. Sometimes you have to go to like a number of different vets to write your prescription for it. You know, it's not something that you can just like order on BRS or whatever. It's, it's a pain to get, but it really, really, really works nicely. Uh, it only takes like a, it's a one day treatment and uh, you can do, you can repeat it like three times and pretty much it, it kills all your, all your amphipods, all your copepods. It'll kill definitely all the red bugs. And unfortunately it also kills your cleaner shrimp and your snails and your peppermint shrimp, all that stuff. And that's horrible, I hate that. One thing that we have started to do was, now that we're able to do really large scale dips, we can do a 24 hour dip, basically by setting up one of these dip stations, having the, that stuff with a heater, with circulation. It's basically an overnight thing, and then we rinse and reintroduce that stuff back into like a cleaner system. That does work too. But I know a lot of folks don't just have the ability to set up hundreds of gallons of dip containers to run Interceptor for 24 hours. But it's but for the for the professional large scale coral farm guys, this stuff is pretty good. Uh, and if you like, I said if you didn't want to directly nuke the tank, you can do this in, in a dip fashion. Uh, one thing though, and I, I will note bubble tip anemone. There are so many different weird crustacean type things that go well beyond red bugs. Uh, this particular guy here is covered in something. I don't even know if it shows up on, on the slide. Maybe, maybe not, right? But we do a lot of like really close macro photography and videography for our YouTube channel. And there's a lot of stuff. I, I can see a lot of really, really, really small things. But there's a lot of stuff that doesn't appear to the naked eye. And some of these things are not problematic at all, perhaps, but some of them might be. And in this particular case, we were just a little bit skeptical of what we were seeing on this like strawberry shortcake acro or whatever. And so we nuked the entire system with Interceptor. Going back one slide, this guy, which we had seemingly no issue with, quadrupled in size the next day. So I'm like, oh. Wow, OK, uh, apparently something was bothering it. And that, that is kind of like the, the surprise benefit to some of these like full tank treatments. It's like you didn't know you had a problem because you never were able to observe that problem manifesting. And then when you throw in a random solution, it, it kind of it treats unexpected things. Uh, I'm kind of lumping in a lot of products here, but I'm just going to lump it all into fluconazole. It's, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Fluconazole is, a, is the algae treatment. Uh, it's good. 
like if you ever have like hardcore algae problems, like when I mentioned about the uh, my herbivores not keeping up with with some type of macro algae, I think it's the ulva. It's like the leafy green stuff. If you guys are familiar with that, um, it's actually like a delicacy in Japan. Um, but it's apparently pretty bad in your tank. It'll it it. it grows like crazy, and eventually some of your herbivores might start to ignore it. Fluconazole is really good at eliminating that stuff. The only problem that I have with fluconazole is that it stunts LPS growth and coloration in certain things. It's very, very, very specific. But some of our LPS that we've been, been growing, like once we do this fluconazole treatment, I think it's like a month-long treatment, a lot of them like color down and it takes a long time to bring them back up to, to like better coloration. So I, I would much rather leverage like the, the herbivores and all that, but again, they didn't work out, so now, now we're having to, to go to these measures. Uh, this is what I wanted to say about like lumping in a bunch of products until basically levamisole, which is kind of like a, a pig dewormer, and it's really, really good at dealing with flatworms. Uh, whole tank flatworm treatments, uh, they are a little bit less effective now than ever before. I remember um, like doing flatworm exit. I remember doing like straight levamisole and it being like a nuclear bomb went off in my tank, and you can just see all the different like flatworms that were in the tank just like die instantly. And now I'm noticing that they're not they're not dying instantly. They might die, but it's different. It's almost like there's like been a lot of like evolutionary resistance to this now, which is kind of a shame. But I find this highly, highly valuable if you're not able to fully break down tanks and, and scrub them super clean because flatworms do just take off running. And just because it is, in, it is a pest that is on one of your corals, this one in particular is like a euphilia one. It's usually on torches. Uh, they do take off running. They, ha they have like other mechanisms to, to protect themselves from uh, your efforts. For example, this flatworm I have seen when you start to dose your tank with stuff will climb into the mouth of the euphilia and just like and, and safe harbor there until it's safe to come out. It's pretty gross stuff. So uh, a regimen to use like a fluconazole type product can help like polish things up if you've gone through all the different stages and now you're at the whole tank treatment stage. Okay, changing gears just a little bit. Chemistry testing. Um, I've had a little bit of a history with chemistry testing. So the, the problem with, with it is um, when you have like multiple systems, right? Because if you have like a single large system, let's say you have like Andrew Sandler's tank, well that's one tank. It, that's really not, not a lot different than testing any other one tank, right? But if you have like let's say 50, 10 gallon tanks and you want to test, you got yourself a little bit of a problem now because that's that's a lot of that's a lot of material that's a lot of effort it's a lot of time that you might have a staff member or yourself having to do right um, so <laughs> this is going to sound really bad but can you just ignore it entirely so this is this is way back in the day but i literally for a, a long stretch did a water test maybe once every three months, <laughs> once every three months. And was the chemistry perfect every single time? Not always. Sometimes it was, it was off by substantially. I think that one time our DKH was down to like three in one of our systems. We were still growing SPS, by the way. It turns out that like you can ignore a lot of problems and it not really manifesting. Uh, but the real, I guess the, the, the takeaway from that is if you're willing to, to go to that level of neglect. Um, if you were to do the water testing, would it actually change your behavior? Or was the solution all along to do a water change? Because if you wanted to circumvent the entire like need to test, if the answer was always to do the water change, just do the water change and move on with your day. Like, you know, you, attention and, and, and time and materials, finite resources. So be honest with, with yourself, right? Are you really going to do excruciating like tweaks to a multi-tank system where running 50 ICPs is gonna be meaningful to you? 
I don't know. It wasn't to me for a very long time. One of my staff members, though, not her, but a guy named Luke, is super hyper particular about testing, and I'm not going to discourage it. So he brute force tests everything now. And he is such, he's so persnickety. And, you know, we, we, we bonk heads over this sort of thing. But he's kind of right. We should test. <laughs> we should test. But, but th this is one thing that I do insist upon, though. It's like, if you're going to hit me with all these numbers and tell me that I need to run GFO to reduce my phosphates, your numbers had better be right, OK? I better not be reacting to ghosts because of your bad testing techniques, right? So here is the thing. Reference standards are your friend. Make sure that like the lies that your test kits are telling you are at least consistent lies. <laughs> and you can like, you know, scale appropriately to, to, to all that. But I, I think that the, the, the worst case scenario is you're getting a, a flawed result and making a lot of decisions based on that. So if you're going to brute force it like we're, we're currently doing, please at least double check the, uh, the numbers that you're getting. So wouldn't it be great if there was technology that would just do this testing for us and we wouldn't have to spend all that time uh, actually physically doing the test. We could spend more of the time just analyzing the results. Sounds great in theory. Uh, I've used, I believe, every auto testing device on the market in multiples, except for maybe like one that just came out. I've used them all, OK? Uh, what happens at scale? Again, it's the topic, right? The, the problem at, at scale is that these things tend to be a little bit more finicky to, um, to constantly have to calibrate and dial in, and there's always an error code on, on something, right? They, they, they do a really, really, really good job when they're working properly. And for a single aquarium, it's fine. You, you fix the little error code, you move on with your day. But when you're dealing with, let's say, a dozen different systems, each over 1,000 gallons or something, and now it's almost like somebody's full-time job to babysit the automation. So in addition to them uh, not freeing up their time and analyzing results, they're constantly fiddling with the automation. And at that point, I can't trust the numbers anymore. And that's the worst thing is like when these things might be running, but I just don't trust the numbers anyway. So it's, it's meaningless. So for us, it didn't quite work out. But hopefully, you know, hopefully things get better and more reliable. But it, for me, it has to be like the most rock solid solution to the point where it is a, it's like a thermometer, like a mercury thermometer. It just works. You know, it has to be like that level before I'll take like a, a lot of automation like that seriously. OK, now that we've kind of talked about like the, the testing end of the thing and like the problem with testing uh, complexity, uh, how would we go about just uh, mitigating that by just trying to set a baseline of chemistry? So even if you're off, you're not going to be off horrifically, right? Like getting a DKH of 3. That's pretty horrific. Let's not do that ever again. One thing is, obviously, I'm a huge advocate of water changes. I know that it goes in and out of fashion to not do water changes. But when you have like a few million dollars at stake, you're probably going to start doing water changes. Like, it, it, it's, it's a relatively cheap activity to do. And if, sorry? Activity. Yeah, it's an activity. <laughs> so just make it as simple as possible. And th this is more for like the really big systems. But what we've done is we actually have a, a freshwater station and a saltwater station. And we are directly pumping it at pressure to every system's sump. So on demand, if we ever need to do a water change, old water goes out. New water, turn a faucet, it's refilling. Topping off, fresh water, it's right there. Because this sort of thing dramatically increases the likelihood that this sort of activity will actually happen. And the, the important thing is that the water changes are happening. Uh, again, neglect will find its way whenever it can into an operation that, that grows to any size and scale. So make it easier on yourself. Make it easier on your staff, whomever is helping you out. Technology can make this 
a lot easier. So big proponent of water changes. I'm that guy. Calcium reactors. Um, I, I personally like them because after you look past like the initial investment of a calcium reactor, it is a very consistent and gentle approach to manage like calcium alkalinity and to some degree magnesium depending on your media. Uh, it's stable. It's hard to like overdo it and nuke your tank, that sort of thing. And the, the maintenance involved is like once every few months. It's not a big deal. So big proponent of calcium reactors on big systems. And they scale nicely too because uh, a hobbyist sized one, excuse me, like the smallest ones handle like 250 gallon tanks. They're, they're very uh, scalable in that regard. So a commercial one is pretty good for thousands of gallons potentially. Uh, and you can also just add in multiple chambers. It's, it's easy, it's easy, it scales. Kalkwasser, also really pretty nice. You're already doing top off. Why don't you go ahead and top off with calc? And I think it's easier in, 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 in big quantities to do it. Because like what you see here, it's just two Rubbermaid Brute trash cans. And uh, we just have like a dosing pump that's going to dose something in the neighborhood of the evaporation for the day. And when it's, when it's done, we just mix up another one, bring it, bring it over, move the lid over, and the peristaltic pump just keeps on keeping on. And there, there's plenty of benefits to running calc. Again, some degree of like phosphate control in there. It's not gentle, but on a, on a peristaltic pump, not, not gentle either, right? And lastly, if need be, you can do the supplemental dosing. But if you've done those other things, the water changes, the calcium reactor, the calcwasser, very likely you're not going to have insanely bad water chemistry. And I think as long as you avoid the insanely bad, your corals can make up the difference. And that, that is like one of the things that I, I appreciate most is like you can get close enough in these things. For a single show tank, I understand where you, you might want to go with something a lot more refined. But on the big, big scale, it matters less than you might think. OK. Moving on to like the device aspect of this. Um, what should you really be prioritizing? And what, what type of things are you trying to solve with how you've, you've constructed your place and what devices that you're choosing to use, OK? So yeah, uh, a super fancy, super high performance system is enticing, but it's not really what you want to be messing with necessarily. So this is a 2008 Honda Accord. I own this car, all right? I still drive this car. It's 15 years old. Uh, this is really what you're looking for. Do you know how many times that thing has been in the shop? Never. It's never been in the shop. But I know plenty of like my friends that have Teslas. They're on their fourth Tesla. All right? You don't want the latest and greatest, like super insane thing. You want something that just is so basic and just works and doesn't mess with you and is always at the shop. Um, there are some really, really, really cool devices, but boy. They're always finicky. You, 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 can't, you can't be in the, in, in the weeds with that. So the stuff that I like really try to focus on is like, re, is, well, I'll just start, start with the redundancy, right? So the, the stuff that I consider mission critical, I want to have some level of redundancy in there. And that is I need water to flow through the system, and I need water to flow through the system at the right temperature. Like, start with the, the ultimate basics, OK? This cannot fail. Absolutely cannot. If my lighting is down for five days, I'll live with it. If my pumps aren't running for five days, we have a much bigger problem, right? That sort of thing. Chemistry dosing, eh, don't worry about it. If, it, if a water change doesn't happen for five days, doesn't matter. Pumps, drainage control, temperature control, this is what we're talking about. So. Uh, the issue, though, again, talking about scale, is that redundancy and scale don't mix, right? Um, 
It definitely works better in like a, a single contained system, but when you start to spider out and get crazy, is like that's that's a mess to deal with, a total mess. Uh, like what you're seeing here with, with just our complexity of plumbing, if we have to double the plumbing, goodness. Like we, we have miles of plumbing, and now we have to double the miles of plumbing. Uh, there, there's ways around it as well. So first off, just with, with, the, with the pumps, I really, really, really love the idea of multiple return pumps, right? Two per system. Uh, this is an abyss. It's a pretty good pump. It will probably not fail, and it is pretty electrically efficient. Uh, there are plenty of pumps kind of like this in terms of reliability, like a Japanese Awaki probably is not going to fail, that sort of thing. But what kind of uh, complicates things is that the, the plumbing aspect of multiple returns, especially once you start going distance, because some of our, our systems are 50 feet long. And to have to send multiple return lines 50 feet, it gets really, really, really cumbersome. And I don't know if you check the price of like plumbing for you know 50 foot runs. It's a lot of money. Like it's way more than this abyss. Like this is a this is a rounding error on the cost of pipe and fittings. Uh, like uh, like a Schedule 80 uh, T, a T like a basic 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 piece is 17 dollars now. Okay, so. Again, additional complexity doesn't scale particularly well, but it might be worth it to consider having multiple pumps. The way that we get around it is that we have a backup pump and we have a lot of active monitoring of the systems. So in a pinch, somebody can swap out the pump. So uh, ideally, there'd be two pumps. Not ideally, you have people that have to like jump out of their chairs and go fix something. Okay, the, on the other end, on the drainage line aspect, uh, we want to avoid a situation where we're gonna have a flood. Uh, so you guys are probably familiar with this as like a, a, a bean animal, uh, triple overflow assembly. I, I guess the guy's like name was actually bee an animal, and, but everybody just kind of butchered it, so he's bean animal now. But, so, it, uh, so your main drain is the gate valved one that controls like the, the water level. The secondary is to set the water level in the overflow box. The third one is the oh no, total emergency full siphon. Technically, that second one could be an emergency and the third one can be emergency. But the point is that if you size the pipe properly, your overflow should never have an issue. But Again, snails can get down there, there can be blockages, things happen. So that's why you have like the secondary and then the, the tertiary. One way to avoid having to run three drains per tank back to your sump, because some of our systems have eight tanks. Eight tanks, three drains per, no, 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 no we're not doing that. So, <laughs> so what we do is we plumb those three down into a massive pipe. So we have either a four or six inch central drain that these guys, and I'm sorry, nothing is going to block a six inch drain that <laughs> went through the weirs of your teeth, you know, overflow, never gonna happen. So, but that's kind of like what we're trying to, to involve here to, to get, just to make sure you don't have an overflow leak situation. Going away from that now to temperature control. Uh, this is something that we are trying to do a little bit better ourselves. But it's, we, we have temperature probes in every system and we have like zone controls on, on everything to make sure that the heating and cooling runs properly. Now, this is probably my biggest regret, is not just pulling more data line between um, like the heating system and the tanks. Because ideally, because a temperature probe, guys, is not that expensive. And they do go bad. And you don't want your whole system like reliant on a single temperature probe. Like mine kind of are. So <laughs> ideally, I, 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 this, this, this is overkill, but you know, there's a lot at stake. I would want like five temperature probes per system. That it would kick out the, the top one, kick out the bottom one, average the three in the middle, then do something. OK? Because la last week, we had a temperature probe just freak out. 
and one of our systems was down to 70 degrees. And we only noticed it because one of our purple tangs stopped eating frozen food. Like, that's weird. And it took us that long to, like, to figure out that, oh, this tank hasn't been getting heat for probably a week. Like, that's not great, right? Ideally, you'd have better probes, you'd have notification systems, something. But you don't want to have the problem that I just had. One thing, um, so one, one other aspect to the heating is to like separate the types of heating. So even though that particular tank didn't have direct heating, we did have heating in the space. So we have like a heated concrete floor on a completely separate system and it's completely separate um, like temperature uh, monitoring setup. So even if that particular boiler goes down, the space itself won't be, won't be lost. The only other big saving grace is like once you start, and this is where scale helps you. I mean, imagine that scale can actually help, is that all these different tanks act as a heat sink. And uh, like the, your, your, your delta loss is not quite so bad when you have 10,000 gallons of properly heated aquariums in and around that thing. So it got chilly, but it didn't get like crushingly bad. Okay, going to like the reliability aspect of this, uh, I never thought that we would have to have just so much junk laying around, because I like to have like a clean place. But it turns out that it, it just having stuff always available is way better than needing it at some point and just not having it around for you. So have duplicates of everything. We have, we have backup abyss pumps. Like, that's, that's painful to have just sitting on your shelf, but it, it helps. And the, the one thing that makes having that one abyss sitting out there okay is that we are, uh, just a part of the design is to use that same pump for like everything, right? Even if it's total overkill, doesn't matter. We have the one backup, it backs up. <coughs> Talking hands. It backs up everything. Backs up everything. Okay, uh, moving along, we're, we're, we're almost done, you guys, almost done. Okay, uh, get this label maker. It's the best label maker, period, <laughs> buy this. Okay, the, the labels that it makes, you can use underwater in your tanks, okay? It's phenomenal. You can hook it up to your phone, you can do it by app, it's great. So we label everything. So all of our plugs that we, we plug in has the device written on it, it's super obvious. We, we label like the actual outlets with like the circuit so it's easy to operate. And lastly, like service reminders on the, on the things that need to be changed out, like resin and, and me, different types of media. It'll be like, you need to change it on this date, super obvious. That helps because what tends to happen is a proliferation of devices and you just lose track. You have no idea how long this pump has not been serviced, for example, right? It's a thing, moving parts, it needs servicing. When? I don't know. How long has it been there? A couple years? Label it. Okay. Uh, real quick on this. Observation, okay? Uh, long story short, get glass tanks, guys. You need to be able to see into your tank. All the bad stuff happens on the underneath of corals. You can't be looking down on it. I know a lot of coral farms like to like save some, some um, resources, not go with glass. They have tubs, get glass. Okay, I'm speed running this thing now. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Uh, problem, obviously, more surfaces to maintain. The observational benefits greatly outweigh it. Greatly, greatly outweigh it. And the last thing as far as equipment goes, get a multimeter. You'd be surprised at how many uh, devices leak um, voltage. Uh, it turns out that we're, we're bad at, at, at quarantining fish, largely because we had uh, 60 volts going to the water, because we had crummy small pumps and crummy other things and crummy heaters. Like, we didn't have an advanced heating system for our, our QT. We had aquarium hobbyist heaters, 60. 40 is lethal, 60 volts. Why did our butterflies die? <laughs> yeah, get a multimeter, test all your tanks. We have, we have on, on one of our like, big, big show tanks, we have dozens of devices on there. Checked it, F under five volts, because they're good products. You know? So again, check, 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 check. 
Uh, lastly, uh, this was like a, a problem that is a sneaky one. Magnets and pumps almost always eventually will leak something you don't want in your tank. So make sure that you look at them, make sure that they're not waterlogged. Happens all the time to us. We once had eight different scraper magnets leaking rust. All right, guys, that's it. I got in. <laughs> all right. Appreciate it. I know that there's a raffle in five minutes, so I will take questions out in the hallway if anybody, anybody wants to hang out a little bit further. But uh, until then, thank you so much for watching my TED Talk. Enjoy. Thank you.